Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 231 doing a weekly Ask Anything. I have traditionally done these when I've hit milestones, but I have a lot of fun with them. So I'm going to give them a try for a few months as a weekly segment on the channel. My goal is to get them out before Monday night, and if this is getting published correctly, it should actually be Sunday evening this week. Uh, I'm not doing it Monday this week because I'm headed out to San Francisco for the next few days. I'm going to be down there for some work-related stuff, and I may even end up at some magic stuff. I'll be there through Thursday. Um, Thursday day is pretty open for me, so if people want to try to connect on Thursday down in San Francisco, please definitely uh, let me know. I don't head back till rather late on the plane there. Wednesday evening I may also be available. Let me also explain the format of this a little bit. Uh, the other Ask Anythings that I've done have been giant. I'm going to be doing three to four questions per week for this one. I'm going to take one from YouTube. So if you've got any questions, post them as a comment to this particular thread, and I will choose one of those to answer in the next one. Um, I'm going to be taking comments on Facebook. Almost nobody heads over there to the Mythic channel on Facebook. Uh, that would be an easier way to have a chance to get a comment through. Um, I will post those after this video goes live. The other two ways are if you see me in person, ask me a question, and there's a chance that that may end up in the next video. Or if you want to make sure that I answer a question 100%, any patrons on the channel at any level from $1 on up will get a question answered each week through this series. And any questions that I don't get to, from them when I hit a milestone, I will make sure to include those in the milestones. So becoming a patron is one way to guarantee that I'll get to your question. Let's jump in here to the first question. Uh, this one came from an earlier video done here on YouTube. And the question is, what do you think about Jace? I've been speculating on whether or not to pick him up after seeing how well he performs. I missed the chance to get into him at $20. And this is super relevant. Yesterday I was watching his price and he was about $45, $50. I posted early this morning that he hit 52 and later today um, he hit 75. He's gone through the roof. The price that he is at is crazy right now. He is more expensive than Snapcaster Mages and can be killed by a lightning bolt or a shock or easy removal in pretty much every format that he's being played in. He is very good, but he's also currently available in Standard. There's a chance that we could still see him printed in a uh, dual deck of some type, although the last dual deck did have Planeswalkers in it, so the next one is not likely to, although he is a creature and a Planeswalker. Uh, we may even see him as a promo somewhere in here. The question, though, is how playable is he in Modern? And in my finance videos, I definitely said people should be picking up the San Diego Comic Con ones and that I would be looking for one. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to pick one up yet. That Premier version is going to have value as he's clearly playable in a Modern. <sighs> so where do I stand on him currently? I would actually avoid picking him up right now. I think he's going to settle by another... $20, $30 down within the next two, three weeks. I cannot see him getting up to a hundred. I am likely would recommend picking up play sets if you really need them in standard when he settles down to about the $50 or $40 range. Uh, the premier versions of him are probably at their high point for a little while now. Also, uh, the foils are going for about $175 and the San Diego Comic Con ones are up around $250. Um, I'm glad that I was able to call that the San Diego ones were going to go up. I did not realize how much the regular ones were going to go up. An in-print Mythic at above $50 is pretty crazy. He would have to be all over the place in the top eights in Modern to sustain anywhere near that, which I don't think he's going to be, although I'm going to be watching the playlist very close. Right now, I would avoid him for a few weeks, see what happens, he'll probably settle down around that $30 to $50 range again here once the hype around him calms down. The next question that I got um, was from somebody over on Facebook, and it was, how do you know which play style of deck fits you? Bef and it was really asked, we've got a rotation here going on in Standard, or if I decide to jump into Modern, 
before putting all that money into a deck, how do I know it's even going to be a deck that I really like to play? And the best thing that you can possibly do is try a bunch of different decks. Proxying them up is one way to do it, but the recommendation I actually have is build your major archetypes in Popper. Popper is an all commons format. I've got a whole video that I'll leave a link here in the about to. It has viable cards for almost everything outside of maybe Planeswalker control, where you can build the major archetypes, practice against them, understand how they work, and figure out which ones you really like. If you're a player that wants to win a game quickly and likes to deal lots of damage, you need to stay away from those control archetypes. You're going to make mistakes in them because they're not really your playstyle. But the same thing goes the other way. I've seen control players try to pick up red deck wins because it's theoretically the best in the environment and just get rolled again and again. Some of the strongest players have distinct play styles, and when they play outside of those play styles, they get crushed. Figuring out your play style is very important, and Popper is one of the absolute best ways to do it. Next question, this one came from an individual who spotted me out and did a trade with me, and it was really, how do you value foreign cards? And I'm going to limit this to specifically FNM promos, because I'm working on a huge video on how do you value foreign cards? It could be a 20 minute video in and of itself. But I traded for an Is It Charm Korean foil, and I've got a pretty good amount of experience dealing with the people over at TokyoMTG.com. I've got some friends there who work there, and they really know this stuff very, very well. When you're dealing with a foreign card, the location you're selling from matters a lot. If you have the opportunity to travel around and pick up cards that are cheap in one location and take them somewhere else where they're very sought after, you can make a significant amount of profit on those trades. Generally, a card in Japanese, Russian, German, Korean um, is worth slightly more than it is in English if it's tournament playable. If it's not tournament playable, it's worth significantly less. Nobody wants the cards that are not extremely tournament playable. If the card is in foil, usually it goes up between 25 and 125% of the value. You look at something like Jace, way up there. You look at something like one of these FNM promos that kind of has edge playability, you're probably talking about double, but you're only getting double because they're so cheap to start with. If it was a $10 card, it would be more like a $12 card in the foil promo. But if it's a $1 card, people are definitely willing to give you that extra dollar in value. So generally, I would say somewhere between about 30% and 100% extra for the tournament playable Japanese, Korean, German, Russian versions. Other languages are a little bit less sought after for some reason, those four, at least here in the Northwest, are extremely sought after. And also when I go to major events like Gen Con or GPs. All of this, though, is very dependent on where you are. If you are in a country where that is the language that is being spoken and that's what's available, they're often the same price as English in the local market. So it's only when you really transport them somewhere else or take them to Star City Game Opens or Pro Tour, that type of stuff, where they really get that extra value. The next questions that I've got are both from Patreon. I threw on two here because uh, one of them is going to be pretty quick. The first one is, what is the longest time you've waited for a speculation to resolve in Magic? And almost all of my buys are done within 12 to 18 months. If it hasn't really realized its value in that time period, either I made a mistake or it's way too long for me to really have invested the money for that period of time. Keeping cash flowing, keeping cards moving is as important as what the increase in value is. Anything you have beyond a playset it's more important for you to move it into something that is moving up currently than hold on to it a really long time to see what the value is going to be. If you're still at a playset, 
hold on to the playset for as long as you are likely to play that particular format. But things above that, you've got to move it into something that's a little more liquid. And I made a little bit of a mistake here with regards to the shocks. The shocks have not jumped up in value yet. I believe they're going to jump up next year. But the reason they haven't jumped up is Wizards has continually printed stuff people want more than shocks. Fetches are better than shocks, so people have been putting their money into fetches. Expedition lands are better than normal shocks, so people are going to start putting their money into expedition lands. There hasn't been a real lull in the market where it's gotten down to the level of these $7, $8 shocks, where people have decided that's really what I would like to invest in next. On the other hand, Abrupt Decay I've had for much longer than that period of time, and I'm still holding on to Abrupt Decays. I picked them up at the $6, $7 range. They've been steadily going up over the last few years. They're about at the $15 to $20 range currently. And I think when we hit the next modern season, that's when I'm likely to trade out as some of the extra ones that I have. It's such an incredible card. I also think that it will see a reprint once we get to the next Modern Master set. So I plan on getting rid of the extra ones that I have before we hit the next Modern Masters, but after we're in the next Modern Season, which is coming up here, end of the year, early next year. Next question that was asked is, what is your favorite creature type and why? And the first time I answered this, I think I really kind of missed the question because I said wizards. Wizards are freaking awesome. They're amazing. They are creatures with spells tapped on top of them. They're just attached to the back of those little creatures, whether it's Insectile Aberration having Lightning Bolt. Okay, the Insectile Aberration isn't a wizard, but Delver is. Or Dark Confidant, which has um, Ad Nauseam printed on it. Snapcaster Mage, which has any spell you want. Grim Lava Mancer, which has Shock on it. And Vendillion Click, I don't even know what spell that is, but that's a cool spell that's posted on top of it. But it doesn't actually feel like a creature to me. It feels like a subtype of creature or a profession to creatures. Now, I know that that's all flavor and that technically these are creature types, but they feel like professions. The actual creature type I really like is one that I've played a few times and am currently playing in EDH, and that is Merfolk. Rogue Merfolk, particularly. I like stealing stuff from other people, whether it's cards or life or Root Water Thief is one of my absolute favorites. Being able to go through somebody's deck and exile stuff is just too cool. I would like to kind of redo an entire Thief deck. There's some great thieves out there. I'm just not sure who I would really use as a commander currently. So my answer is Merfolk when it comes for creatures. And when we're talking about professions, it's Wizards or Rogues, which are the two things that I name on Cavern of Souls most often outside of humans. If I'm not playing Death and Taxes, I'm often naming wizards or rogues. Great question. A lot of fun to think about that. Even chatted with a few friends about it. If you like this series and would like me to bring to light some knowledge on a particular topic, ask a question here and subscribe to the channel. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everybody who's over there on Patreon supporting the channel. I'm having a great time doing this. We've got a lot of videos coming between now and the end of the year. I'm dedicating a significant a large amount of time to the channel. I'm going to be traveling a lot here in the next few months. I'm going to be in San Francisco next week. I'll be at the GP in November here in the Seattle, well, actually Tacoma area. I'm going to be down at BGG Con in Texas the week before Thanksgiving. And I've got a little bit more travel still being planned, but I'll definitely let people know what's going on. As I'm headed out to places like Dallas-Fort Worth or San Francisco, I'd really appreciate to have your suggestions on any local game stores that I should check out or events that are going on while I'm down there. I still don't have the full setup to do great videos while traveling, so videos are going to be a little sparse there, but I'm going to make up for it on the weekends and other times when I'm back in town. Take care. This has been Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech. Casting wizards and attacking with dragons. Dragons are super popular, too. I really like dragons. A Dragon EDH is probably my next one on this list. Ah, I should rebuild that Dragon EDH.